Hi, I'm Yaakov Katz, and welcome to the Jewish People Policy Institute's Insight and Analysis of the State of Affairs in Israel and the Jewish World. On today's episode, we're going to take a look at the situation on college campuses in the United States. To do that, I spoke with Dr. Michal Biton, a researcher at NYU, a Rosh Kihila, spiritual leader of the downtown Minion in New York, and one of the more outspoken and passionate speakers in defense today of Israel across college campuses. You might have seen her speak at that massive rally a few months ago in Washington, D.C. I then catch up with two of my JPPI colleagues, Professor Michal Barasher Siegel, who I actually spoke to as she is visiting Penn under her hat as the vice president of Ben Gurion University, as well as with Noah Slepkov to look at how Israeli policies are affecting the conversation at colleges across America. Here we go. Michal, thank you so much for joining the JPPI podcast. It's great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, you've been, I, I have to say, you know, I've there's so much out there and there's so much so much to watch and so much to read but uh, i've seen a couple of videos of you speaking at the dc rally that that massive one that brought hundreds of thousands of people and and just also like the little gatherings i don't know if they were at union square washington square wherever they might have been or just near nyu really just galvanizing in a passionate way the jewish uh kids on campus to feel proud to stand up uh, and not to be ashamed, despite all these stories that we're hearing of people who are hiding the Megin David or taking off their keep on campus. Or, I, I you know, uh, on this episode, where later I'll be joined by uh, two of our fellows. One of them is uh, Michal Barasher Siegel, who is uh, currently, when I spoke with her, she's at Penn uh, on a trip and they had assigned security to her and other academics who had come with her from Ben Gurion University. Uh, you know, so maybe just walk me through a bit. A, what brought out this passionate response on your on your part, and and B, um, how bad is it from what you see? You know, at your perch at NYU, uh, how bad is the situation? Um, sure. So I'll start the first question. I think, uh, listen, what, what brings out the passion? I think I am convinced that we are right now in an existential moment for the Jewish people, not only in Israel, but around the world. So I think if there is a moment to be passionate and to speak up, it is now. Um, and for us here in America, there's a lot of heartbreak just seeing, um, you know, our extended family in Israel uh, and really just seeing a lot of hatred around the world. So I, I think uh, the I think everybody should be passionate and everybody should be really speaking up right now. There's no no other time to put everything on the table to fight for our um, safe existence around the world. Um, in terms of campuses, I would say um, I would say that generally it's important for anybody who wants to be helpful. So to be helpful, we have to diagnose carefully, right? We don't want to just be reactive and only see what's happening like on Instagram, right? So having said that, I think campuses are very different and every campus has a life of their own and the situation for college students and for university professors like you just mentioned on a given campus will depend a lot on how strong the Jewish community is on the campus, how strong is the administration and how strong are the, I'm not going to call them pro-Palestinian, I'll say pro-Hamas voices on campus. So there are some campuses where I've met students who are like really really feeling totally alone and besieged and there are campuses where I've met students who feel really supported and they feel like they're fighting right now. And there's campuses where I've met both types of students because they're in different positions um, in that campus. So, so it's important for me to name this because I speak with so many students, uh, it's important for me to name to any external stakeholders that I think what we have to do right now is be incredibly uh, strategic um, and just do a lot of initial legwork to try to figure out like what's happening in this campus how can I be helpful in this particular situation? And like take the to give me an example, you know, if a college campus, let's say, where kids are feeling unsafe. And and you know, we just saw, I think I read somewhere, nine uh students went to Capitol Hill, gave testimony again about the feelings of anti-Semitism. We, of course, everyone remembers what happened with the three university presidents, presidents who, who testified before Congress, two of them then stepped down from Harvard and Penn. 
when there is that situation on campus, what can be done to reinvigorate or to give the Jewish students this feeling that they are safe and that people have their back? Yes, yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. Um, one of them is to to it. It sounds very simplistic because it is simple. I don't I don't feel like I have something that uh, that is too revelatory here. But two nights ago, I did like an event at NYU, and I spoke with some students afterwards from neighboring schools, and some of them were describing some really bad situations. So I spoke to them. I asked them, "Who's your support system? Who's the the rabbi there? Who's the heel professional? Here are some numbers that you can call. Here's my number. You call me whenever you need to. Um, do you have a place to go for Shabbat dinner? Because you don't just need to fight. You need to have a place where you get nourishment and you get you know that feeling of um of support. Here's some legal resources. Um, so all of those things are helpful, and all of these things are incredibly specific to a particular campus. I know I said that before, and I sound like a broken record, but there is no one size fits all kind of solution to make things work. So that's number one, meet the students who are struggling, sit with them, do a deep dive. Do you have your support? What support do you need? What does it mean to be strategic right now? Because we don't wanna be reactive. This is not gonna go away in a week or two. This is here to stay. So if it's here to stay, we have to be smart and strategic. The second thing I would say Yaakov is that um, I think that we need to also help students be resilient. There is a culture in a lot of um, liberal spaces that really center feelings of trauma and vulnerability and fragility. And I, I am really convinced that part of what we need to do is yes, give resources to students, but also help students know that they are strong, they are resilient, and they have the kind of strength that we didn't, that, that many of us maybe didn't think we had that. Uh, and, that and that there are certain things that we can take on and that we have to be ready to fight because these environments, if they're not going to treat microaggressions towards Jewish students and Zionist students, the way they treat them to other groups. So part of our response right now needs to be to stand up, to have a thick skin. I often say we have to learn from Israelis, right? The way that Israelis have risen up and fought um, and we have to be really ready to take this on. I read the, the piece that you recently wrote for Times of Israel just before Purim uh, about, you know, the the, current situation, Israel's war against Hamas, what's happening also with American Jewry and the comparison and the question that you asked, is America the Shushan of, uh, of, of, you know, in 2024, basically are Jews vulnerable today like they were back then where they're at risk of, uh, you know, I don't want to say used harsh words, annihilation or genocide, but in, in, in a, in a in risk in a, in a grave manner that hasn't been, the way things were in the past, there was recently the the piece in in the in the Atlantic of uh, of where we saw how the uh, the end of the golden age of of American Jewry. So, is America Shushan? Well, as I wrote in that piece, I don't think so. <laughs> I think, thank God, uh, thank God, for now we are not in a place where the government and uh, institutional and structural powers have turned against Jews. We still live, thank God, in a liberal democracy where there is the rule of law and where minorities are protected. And we see in polls that still the majority of Americans are philo-Semites, if I'm saying it right. Uh, they support Jews, they support Israel as well. Um, the, 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 what, I, what I try to actually tease out there um, without diminishing the rise of like, a kind of like racial anti-Semitism in which there's like swastikas, you know, and Jews are just being targeted without diminishing that. I do think that to me, the biggest or, or the main danger that I'm thinking about is what I termed the Hanukkah danger, which is when there is a war against a certain type of Judaism more than against Jews. So Hanukkah, if all the Jews would have agreed to become Hellenized, right? You know, the, the, the Greeks wouldn't have waged war against them. The Greeks wanted to wage war against a particular Judaism. In liberal America today, not everybody, but in many, many sites of knowledge and cultural production amongst many elites, there is increasingly a war against a certain ethnic Judaism that has solidarity with Jews in Israel and that has a connection to Israel, the land of Israel, the state of Israel, Jews living there. Um, so, and part of what that war, the way that it plays out is this uh, systematic attempts to drive pro-Israel and Zionist Jews underground and to make 
not just Israel, but any pro-Israel or Zionist sentiment become like pariah, you can't mention it out loud. So to, to me, that is really, um, it's really, really important to focus on this danger and to try to figure out what does it mean to resist the very real pressure to go underground and the very real pressure to disavow this kind of Judaism as the price of acceptance in liberal society. I mean, is 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 part of the concern, I wonder, that you're going to have these, these, let's say, college campuses, but it could happen elsewhere, of where Jews who feel under siege and under attack in a way that they weren't before will not only hide Judaism, but want to walk away from Judaism, not, won't, won't want to be part of this. Yeah, I mean, that that's, that's part of it. I think I, I had a couple of things that were driving me to write that piece. One is that I think even those who don't want to walk away from Judaism might feel a tremendous amount of pressure just to hide it. And I think a lot of, I think many of us, there's a very understandable and logical reaction to intimidation, which is to go underground. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? So, and I think we need to fight that. I think we need to, we don't have to be, you know, to have illusions of our safety. We have to be careful, but we also need to figure out what does it mean to actually say this is a war and the war is over the public square in America and whether my form of Judaism will be welcomed in it. Um, the other concern that was animating me, and you spoke about campuses before, I'll tell you I was um, at a certain campus, a very prominent campus, I don't want to say the name, but a couple of weeks ago speaking to students there, um, and I, I spoke to about 30 students uh, who were pro-Israel in this campus, and when I was trying to hear from them what is hardest about this moment and about fighting the pressure to go underground as pro-Israel students, their immediate answer was that according to their estimates, 30% of those who identify as Jewish in any way on their campus are JVP adjacent, okay? So imagine if you are a student on campus trying to say that a certain form of anti-Zionism anti is anti-Semitic and 30% of the Jewish students population are aligned with that kind of anti-Zionism. I think the opposite, JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, right? So very yeah. far left extremist organization. I mean, JVP right now is like clearly outside the consensus of the Jewish community. There's like no question about it. But you're like saying no... it gives it gives legitimacy to the anti-Israel or pro-Hamas organization. They say, what do you mean? There are Jews who stand with us. It's not just that it gives them legitimacy. It makes the job of the Jewish students mm. who are trying to advocate for themselves. It makes it really, really hard. Because if you're trying to say, listen to what I'm saying as a Jewish student and why, you know, saying that support, that that, that, that Zionism is uh, is racism, uh, is anti-Semitic, for example, uh, the second that you have a large segment of your campus community on the other side, you lose a lot of your tools to be able to fight back. And part of the reason that it's important for me to actually say we need to diagnose carefully what we're facing here is to understand that when there is a war against Judaism, as opposed to Jews, right? So when it's Judaism that's being targeted, in this case, a Zionist ethnic Judaism, there are always, and historically have always been Jews who decided to, um, to repudiate their Judaism uh, as the price of acceptance. I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm making sense right now, but basically think about- I mean, like, historically, I get it. You know, you go back to, I don't know, the times that the, the, the Greeks or the Romans ruled Israel, there were the, you know, the Hellenism and, and Jews who decided to embrace that and, and walk away from the religion. Not just walk away from the religion, many of them became the chief persecutors right. of their former co-religionists. We have so many examples of that, you know, in, in so many times. And I think it's important for us to understand whenever there is a war against our Judaism, there are going to be a, a, a significant number of Jews who will turn their backs on the Jewish community and who will join in this um, kind of effort to drive Judaism underground. And we need to figure out what are the tools? What is the strategy? Again, we cannot be reactionary. I get a little bit frustrated, I'll be honest with you right now. Sometimes I get frustrated because I think that for very understandable reason, we we, we just want to be anxious and outraged all the time. Right. But when well, we're Jewish, so we're we are anxious all the time. But yes. <laughs> well, maybe Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, but <laughs> I'm sorry, you're Sephardic. I, yeah, yeah, I apologize. Yeah. Yes. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but I, I, I and I am outraged too. But but I think that we are a small people, and we have a, a, a limited amount of resources. And if we are driven by by outrage, we are not going to be strategic. So that's partially why I feel it's 
it's part of my responsibility to tell stakeholders, you want to help on campus, for example, understand each campus in its own terms, understand the war being waged there, who are your allies, what, what is your vision of yeah. what it means to win? Like it requires real strategy and it requires to say, it's not going to get fixed in like a week or two. It's not about one campus event. It's, it's, it's a war. You know what I mean? It's, it, it takes real strategy. I mean, you know, what you're saying kind of rings a bell for me to some extent. You know, a lot of groups that I've met with and all these solidarity missions that come to Israel and everyone wants to know from every federation, wherever they might come or every synagogue, what can we do? You know, what what, what should ever, you know, what, what should we be doing in America or some other diaspora community? And I don't tell people how to spend their money and what organizations to give to. But the, the problem that I often find is just the ignorance and lack of education and I, and, and I, you know, before we also, one thing that, again, but I'm more of an outsider, is before we start to preach to the non-Jews of how they should look at Israel, do our, do our kids, do their kids have the knowledge and the skills and the information and the context? And I think that they don't, right? You know, if you go to day school, maybe a little more than a Jewish kid who doesn't, but even kids in, Jewish kids in day school aren't getting that type of uh, foundation, to be able to counter what you're describing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree we have a crisis of education. I'm also a little bit, um, I, part of the challenge though, this is like a challenge that that I'm, the, we're not the only ones who face this. Many, you know, many all across the world were facing it, that education and knowledge are not necessarily good tools to fight in a misinformation age, you know, when you're trying to, to change the, um, the views of, of Gen Z Americans, let's say. And many of them, their their brains are like increasingly primed to like a TikTok kind of like information yeah. delivery. So so I, I agree with you about the need of education, even as I think that we are in a really complicated time and we need to figure out what it means to fight multiple battles, uh, to 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 educate our community, to to educate outside of our community. And it's not just education, it's it's public relations, it's it's information warfare. It's like really taking this, um, taking this seriously um and, and trying to figure it out um i'll say by the way I, I i'll just i'm assuming you know there's listeners from like all over the world like you know in israel america who are listening um i will say that i have been speaking this week and last week increasingly i'm just hearing from more and more uh american jews who are who are struggling um they're struggling with knowing that they support israel's just war against hamas they're struggling um taking that into account, knowing there's so much anti-Semitism. And they're struggling because they don't always feel like the government of Israel is taking seriously what it means to not just wage a war and wage a war morally, but also wage a war that communicates that we are doing so to the rest of the world. Um, so there is a real, I think, uh, crisis uh, in not yeah. taking seriously that in the same way the IDF is small compared to like other countries in terms of like the you know uh the countries that surround israel but they're strategic and they're smart and it's like we need to have something similar when it comes to real um information um and and communication technology information warfare is another one of the fronts of the of the battle and uh unfortunately in israel we we still do not take that as serious as we should uh but Michal, I want to thank you very much for joining us and giving us your insight. Dr. Michal Biton, uh, it was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So Michal uh, and Noah, it's great to have both of you with us. Michal, I want to start with you. Um, we're catching up uh, while you were in at Penn uh, University. And um, it's an interesting place to be at, considering that it wasn't that long ago that the president of Penn, Liz McGill, was... Uh, forced or compelled or felt the need to resign after that disastrous hearing before Congress where she uh, had the smirk on her face for most of the time and was being asked by uh, Representative Stefanik, we're not going to get into the politics of all of it, about anti-Semitism, calls for genocide against Israel. And I'm just curious and about the whole, yeah, it depends on the context answer. What's the mood like there now? Um, 
First, I'm not sure that I would agree with your description of the president, the former president. We'll leave it aside for a second. I think they were very, um, it was a complicated uh, hearing for those president, not that I am defending it, but uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying that she had a smirk on her face. But um, yes, it's, it's very complicated and Penn specifically. What's interesting about Penn is Penn was the first university. So I serve as the vice president of my university for global engagement. I, I teach at Ben Gurion University. And I'm in charge basically of the of the vision of global uh, engagement of Ben Gurion University with academic institutions around the world. And um, after October 7th, um, and after the hearing of the presidents, Penn organized the first visit of solidarity to Israel of academic, which has now become, uh, they were basically showing the way to other Ivy League universities since we've had delegation from professors from Harvard and, and MIT and Berkeley, et cetera, and Stanford. But um, uh, Penn was the first. And it's not an official uh, Penn delegation. These are professors that teach at Penn who felt uh, the need to show solidarity with Israel. This is mostly Jews, but not only. Uh, and they came. And they came to Israel, um, I think it was um, November. And they came, uh, a, a very substantial group from Penn, and they visited Ben Gurion University and other universities in Israel, and they visited uh, the South uh, and um, the uh, Otef, the Yishuvei Otef uh, around Gaza. And, um, and that meeting with them was very meaningful to us as academics. This, this was, a, we, we felt, as everyone did in Israel, very isolated, very alone, but especially in academia when the attacks on Israel and criticism was uh, becoming uh, very severe. And we saw this, um, the, the hearing of Congress and the presidents refusing to admit uh, um, the very obvious truth about anti-Semitism and saying everything depends on context. So it was very jarring and very scary. And then we, we get this delegation coming from Penn. It was very moving, and but mostly it kind of um, um, signaled that we can actually do can collaborate and engage with universities around the world, even at a time when some university declare that they won't have any relations with Israel. We have certain universities that declare that. Um, in the US now, more and more university pass resolution to boycott Israel. In, in Europe, some university, Leuven University in Belgium, for example, uh, declare that they won't have Torino in Italy, won't have any academic relations in Israel. But in the US, uh, Penn was one of those universities where the professors themselves came. Uh, what happens now, I'm, I'm, you're interviewing me when I'm at Penn uh, in Philadelphia, um, uh, where we came with our president for uh, a follow-up meeting, and they're hosting us. Uh, by the way, not just Penn, we're continuing here for Drexel University that showed incredible support, UConn, we have other universities as well that we're visiting. Um, and basically, this is a meeting uh, that we met the entire day yesterday at Penn with the uh, um, the, the current uh, president and the provost and the vice provost for global engagement, et cetera, et cetera. We, we meet with, the, with the, um, and people from engineering and water system and all the stuff that we want to uh, advance uh, academically and, and Jewish studies. Um, and we worked. We worked together to try to promote collaboration between Israel and Penn. So you're catching me at a moment when I'm saying um, I see a sliver of, 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 of good I see uh, a place where we can actually um, take this moment and and build on it for a better relationship between Israeli academic institutions such as Ben Gurion University and universities around the world, including those at Ivy League universities. So Noah, I mean, you know, this sliver of hope that Michal is talking about, uh, and I and I do want to get back to that in a moment to Michal, but I think you know from hearing this. It, it, the images that we Israelis are seeing, right, are very different and the reports that we're getting of what's happening on college campuses are very different. And it seems as if these have become places of where anti-Semitism is thriving. Yeah, I mean, this is a classic example of a selection bias. You only hear about the bad examples of, of the, the, the outlying incidents. Um, you know, I can give you an example. When I was working uh, doing Israel advocacy at the University of Western Ontario, there was like a swastika in the bathroom of the library or something. And like, of course, if like this was in the news, you know, Canadian University finds swastika graffiti, it would like blow up and people would start complaining that it was like, oh, it, the school is not friendly to Jews. It's, there's anti-Semitism on the campus. There's like one person high in the library doodling. 
and and like you know we don't need to make it into like a big uh, national anti-Semitic emergency. Um, so I think that of course there are egregious violations of of people's rights of of outright anti-Semitism taking place across campuses in North America. I'm sure also in other places in the world. But these are incidences are not representative of what's going on. I, I'm sure most students can go to campus um, and, and not be bombarded with uh, direct attacks of anti-Semitism. That's not to say they won't see people protesting the situation in Israel. Um, you know, but somebody protesting the situation in Israel is not necessarily anti-Semitic. Um, you know, it's it's a slippery slope, of course, and I'm sure some protests uh, are could be classified as anti-Semitic, while others are not. So, Michal, I mean, you know, you're on this tour. You're you're meeting with the new president and the provost, and going to other colleges. And your job as vice president or or VEEP, as as we like to call it, uh, no, um, of uh, Ben Gurion University, is uh, is that global engagement. Have you sensed a a change in the dynamic of not only the acceptance of you Israeli academics overseas, but also of you know. You mentioned Penn coming here with their solidarity mission. Very nice, but but in general. Has the mood changed or are we telling ourselves stories? I'll, I'll tell you about my visit now. When So the solidarity visit was in November. We're discussing our trip here early December. Uh, and now we're um, beginning of April and it's different than uh, the conversation we had at the time. Uh, first of all, all of a sudden in the past week, um, they've decided to uh, give us a uh, security detail while we're here, both at Penn and at Drexel. There's uh, guards going around with us. Um, this follows on uh, a protest that was done against my equivalents in Tel Aviv University, Milet, uh, that uh, went to Australia uh, for a, some kind of a fair of academic you know, programs and uh, was attacked by protesters in, in the room she was staying at. Um, so the continuation of the war and the great exposure of the aftermath of what's happening in Gaza uh, and the humanitarian crisis there uh, portrays Israel in a different light than it was in the first months after October 7. Um, now, uh, this conversation I'm having with my colleagues in the universities are no longer, you know, what's acceptable as a reaction for October 7. October 7th is no longer uh, um, on the conversation, but just the measures Israel is taking in Gaza and things that our uh, current government is saying out loud and, um, you know, uh, the, the rift between uh, the U.S. president and, and BB. So these are the conversation that is are very different than the ones I used uh, to have two months ago when, when I was planning this trip. So now they're afraid for my safety. There was a discussion whether we can post pictures on social media from our visit. Is there, is there stuff that we've been discussing? Uh, is it a secret visit? Is it an open visit? Uh, does it hurt our chances if I'm talking to you openly about this or not for collaboration? All so of these are. People who are listening, don't share. Don't that share. <laughs> uh, th this, these are, these are uh, complicated times. And um, again, as a person who identified uh, and uh, personally identify with criticism of some measures that uh, my government has been taking for the past uh, decades. Um, this this is a complicated position to defend, um, even though obviously um, I'm a Zionist and I'm a very proud Zionist and I, I, I um, uh, support our, our, our right to defend ourselves and obviously our right to exist, which I have to say that's another conversation I've been having. Does Israel even have the right to exist? It's a conversation I never thought I would have, um, um, especially in the aftermath of October 7th, I have to defend our right to exist in, uh, in, in Israel. So all of these are, are complicated and they're getting more and more complicated uh, the longer the war extends and, and Israel's leadership points in a certain direction. Well, I mean, also this week was not a good week in that sense, Noah, the, the killing of the aid workers in Gaza and mistaken strike against some vehicle, I think, in Deir al Balach, the, uh, the I forget the name of the organization, the kitchen. Um, World Kitchen? 
important. Yeah, organization and, um, you know, also just the feeling that things seem to be stuck on the ground, but then also the Shifa hospital images that come out. And while to me, it seems definitely legitimate what the IDF did there, when you look at the before and after pictures of what Shifa looked like before and what Shifa looks like now, these are going to be difficult conversations to have around the world. And one thing about PR always, which I try to remind people, is no matter how good the PR is, it can't cover up for bad policies, right? And and when, when things it, that are bad do happen. It's true, but I think it's even more complicated than that. I think uh, we in Israel are in a fighting mode and we're not uh, inclined. I think the support for the war is still overwhelmingly um, uh, positive. And I think we are not seeing the pictures that the rest of the world are seeing. We're not getting in our media, in our you know TV news, etc. We're not getting the images that the word is getting from Gaza. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, I'm I, watching Channel 12, and and they are showing images. Oh, not not even close to what the world is seeing. Not even close. I'm I'm I'm, I'm watching here. I'm I'm sitting in actually my hotel room. I've never look even TV. Noah. You look even yesterday at the front the what front the homepage of the New York Times. The main story is this video showing the before and after of Shifa Hospital. You didn't see that in and mainstream I, I, Israeli websites. Right? We don't show those things. And 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 you it's, know what? it's it's more than that. It's dying babies. It's starving babies. This yeah, is this is this is the the amount of of nutrition going into Gaza, uh, the numbers of th these are these are these are figures and images that we in Israel are not dealing with. And even if there's something, you know, it's it's always look how, what they say about us. It's not look what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't. I'm not saying anything here about what we should do and shouldn't do while we have our hostages, you know, buried in in tunnels in Gaza. I'm not saying what we should do. This is not my place, but I'm saying we're not uh, getting the full picture. I'm not sure they're getting the full picture, but just showing that. But that part is not something that we in Israel deal with. And this is something that has to be part of the conversation as well, at least in order to understand what the world is thinking about what we do. I mean, I, I think you have Israelis who are fighting in Gaza who are well aware of what's taking place there. Um, and I mean, for example, soldiers that go into Gaza, they see that, you know, almost every house has like a uh, a map of all of Israel that, you know, that it, it, on their walls. Um, and I think your point about they don't see the whole story, too. I think I think that is is essential here, that while we might not see um, the the specifics of the destruction that you're talking about, first of all, we are on Telegram, um, the there all the channels in Telegram that are full you can see like they'll post a uh, a picture of like a, a hostage video um, of that will show you know graphic images and they'll have like you know half likes and half like sad because half are Arab and half are Israelis who are reacting reacting to these images on Telegram and I think that ultimately what bothers me the most about the the discord in in America um, is, is that. They, they don't own the war. This, the war against Israel is a war of choice. Hamas decided to start this war, and Hamas is still not um, agreeing to the conditions to end the war. They could agree to the, the terms that Israel lays out to stop, the, to stop the fighting, and they choose not to. And that, I think, is, is critical, and that, that's not something that you're that people really fully understand that well I, I i mean i think that part of what the divide here also is is that and this is always going to be the case right is israelis see what they see and we still feel the aftermath of october 7th and the fact that hostages are being held there and you know the only reason for example let's also be honest for a moment the only reason that these aid workers and this story grabbed headlines and got president biden to speak out in you know what seemed like rage yesterday about the the killing of these people is because they're not palestinian and had they been palestinian it would have been another event that well, would have well, kind of just they, slipped they, slipped well, under the radar they're dual a lot of them from what i understand and if i'm wrong i apologize some of them have dual citizenship which doesn't change the situation it, I, you know 
the the innocent lives lost, no matter what their nationality are, is 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 terrible. No, but it does it does grab attention more, and I think that this is part of the again. But, I, I, but also second. in this case, but in this case, Israel admitted we made a mistake. This was unintentional, but it was us. It wasn't like the time that everyone said, oh, Israel just killed No, no, I, I'm not, by the way. That's, that's the, the, one of the... Don't get me wrong. War is terrible. Mistakes happen in war. Sadly, this is apparently, we'll find out what the investigation discovers. Hopefully it was a mistake and not intentional. But I, but Michal, I want to get back to you. The, 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 this divide, though, between the way we Israelis are looking at this war and the way it's being looked at, even by people who are friends of ours, who you're meeting, who are giving you security at Penn, it's very different. Yes, and I think uh, none of what Noah said contradict what I said. It's not again. I'm not going into details of you know should we be in Gaza? Should we do certain acts? Uh, you know, mistakes happen and the framing of the mistakes, all of this, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying we're we're focusing at what, you know, makes us less uncomfortable. And uh, we should acknowledge the fact that there is ramification, severe and awful ramification to the war, to the people in Gaza. Starving babies, there is nothing, you know, actual picture of, 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 of humanitarian crisis in a level that's very, very severe. Now, you're talking about the deal that Hamas is not agreeing to. I don't know. I also feel I'm not getting the full picture on the deal on our side and our refusal, you know, to. And again, the the, the fact that we, uh, the Israeli people support the war in very large number, but on the other hand, show complete uh, disbelief and not supporting of the current government is a very, very uh, difficult gap to, you know, to overcome. Right. So we're, we're, we're supporting a war but we're not supporting the government that decides the action done in the war. This is a very complicated situation to, to deal with. And again, we're taking these stands uh, when we're not fully exposed to the picture that the rest of the world is, is focused on. And this is something that needs to, 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 you know, it's not that I'm saying that, you know, um, that the picture they're getting is the right picture, right? But it is, right, it's right. happening and we're not being exposed enough to that when we get, when we decide to go out and protest for the replacement of the government or to support this government in whatever it's doing or to support the war or ask for it to be, to end or to support a, a deal with, for the hostages or not. All of these are, should be based, by the way, you said everyone is exposed to Telegram. Not so. There's entire no, generations no. that are not. But, but, but Michal, I think uh, ultimately the point here is that you have Hamas, which is goal in this war is the elimination of Israel. They do not want Israel to exist. This is what they're fighting for. No, and no, as long no, as this, no, as long no, as this is, is their goal, then this is the war that's taking place. And that's why this is a war of choice. They're no. deciding. So no, but the, the 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 connection between your first part and your second part is not obvious. Yes, if this is Hamas, it's awful, and we should eradicate it. Yes, what's the way to do it? Are we doing it the right way? Is the price we're paying worth it? Does it lead to where we want it to lead? All of these, the second part of that, no one's arguing about the first part. Oh, that's not true. That's exactly the point in America. No, I, I disagree. Wrong. No, no, this I actually, really wrong. I actually People disagree. America, this is why you're having the conversation about whether or not Israel has a right to exist. Oh, because no. Hamas is fighting for Israel not to exist. No, and no. And that is the, what the discord is. The fact that you're having the conversation, does Israel have a right to exist, is the point. Maybe Hamas's war is just because Israel doesn't have a right to exist. Again, we're talking about a certain part of the population here that talks about Israel's right to exist, and we're talking about people who support Hamas. Yes, and we're not talking about those. Now I'm talking about the people who support the war in Israel and agree with your decision about Hamas. From the first part, I'm talking about myself and my colleagues. We're, we're getting from there to what we're doing now in Gaza and the war and the deal with the hostages that's on the table, are we getting the full picture to get from here to here, right? This is not obvious at all. And actually, well, it's not obvious to the people I mean, I'm is... talking, it's not obvious also to the people I'm talking with in the United States who support Israel, who are Zionists, but don't support what we do now in Gaza because of the full picture we're not getting in Israel. And that's a conversation 
No one should take, just because Hamas wants to kill us and did this most horrible thing that imaginable and we need to defend himself, doesn't justify everything. And we have to ask ourselves, is it just, and again, I'm not saying it's not. I'm not taking yeah, any side in this conversation. I'm just saying. We're not getting the full picture. One last point. Yeah. You didn't get the full point. You didn't get the full picture in uh, what America did in World War II. You didn't get the full picture in World War One. You didn't get the full picture in the Vietnam but War. I, can I, no, can I tell you something about that? Yeah, claim? It's the, Is yeah, that it doesn't? Yeah. No, but 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 you know what? It it doesn't really make a difference because at the end of the day, and here I'll have to agree with Michal, is that the 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 Israeli people are not asking tough questions. And I think I think you know you, you see that in the media coverage. You see that in the conversations that we're having. You see that in the hoorah behind everything that the army says. You see that in the way that every statement that the army puts out, it's as if it's the holy grail. And there's very little inquisitive investigations. I mean, when's the last time, let, let's be honest, when's the last time one of us read a real investigative report in one of the Israeli media that wasn't something that was given to them? You know, they call it an exclusive, I, I, but yeah, it's I mean, an exclusive interview with some officer that the IDF has anyhow given you. We don't have that today. In I don't have, in, I don't see investigative reporting the Israeli media in general. Right. Like, okay. So then there you so, go. So we're not, and we're not asking the right questions of our leadership. We're not asking the right questions about what's happening. Right, but, 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 a, but here's one war, thing. That, that, that's not, war, war is, listen, when, when Russia. But war, war no, time, war is the time that you definitely need to do that because these are the policies that are being done in the, in, in uh, these are, there's action that's being taken by. I agree with you that the government is not effective and it would be better if there was some type of election sooner than later. There's no doubt about that. And that we'll part- have to get to another time about the election. But for now, I want to thank Noah and Michal and uh, everyone who joined us. You can catch us next Monday for another episode of the JPPI Inside Analysis. In the meantime, have a great weekend. A Shabbat Shalom, Michal. Stay safe Thank with you. your security over there at Penn. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye.